Today is March 18th, 2024. It is 6.49 p.m. and this interview is being conducted in the study rooms, third floor of the Galasano building. My name is Jonah Mysick. I am the interviewer. Today I am interviewing David Kim. We are conducting this interview to find out about his experiences before, during, and slightly after his graduation at RIT as an alumni. All right, David, before we get started, may I ask for your verbal consent to record this interview? Yes, I consent to the recording of this interview. All righty, let's get started. So first, can, can we start by, uh, I want to ask you to state your full name, the year you graduated from RIT, as well as what program or programs you participated in while you were here. Yeah, so my name is David Kim. I graduated from RIT in 2022. Um, I graduated with a bachelor's degree in web and mobile computing and also a minor in history. And yeah, that's what I studied while I was here. When and where were you born? I was born in Queens, um, exact hospital I will not disclose. <laughs> but That's fine. Yes, but I'm a New York native. Um, I basically lived in New York my entire life and only really left the Long Island slash New York City area for when I came out to RIT for college. Interesting. So before that, what was the farthest you ever like left? Furthest I ever left? Like yeah. travel wise? Yeah, yeah like travel wise. Probably Canada. Oh, wow. So you have, you have. Yeah. Where in Canada? We went on a family trip to like the. To Montreal and also hit Quebec while we were up there. Oh, nice. So, oh, I've never that before. I've only <laughs> been to Niagara Falls. <laughs> so, on that note, so describe, you grew up in Queens, describe, can you describe for me like the, the community that you like grew up in? Like, what, what was it like? Where you lived? Yeah, so I was born in Queens, but my family actually lived in Long Island. Um, specifically, the town is Comac. Uh, very suburban, very, uh, very white. <laughs> so I was very much a minority, technically, um, within my, my high school, um, being of Asian descent, specifically Korean descent. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think I was definitely, there was definitely a slight case of racism on occasion. <laughs> yeah. Um, but other than that, I mean... My parents are immigrants, and they worked very hard to get here to the U.S. and to give me and my family, my siblings, a good chance to, you know, grow and be successful. So, yeah, definitely don't take it for granted. But um, the town that I actually live in, very wealthy for the most part. And, but, I mean, not me, though. <laughs> I wish. Not but, yet. Not yet. But, um, but, yeah, I mean, I had a lot of friends growing up up and uh you know spent a lot of time hanging out outside before tiktok took over everything and we, became, <laughs> we all became glued to our screen <laughs> um but yeah i mean i have a very loving family uh fall with my brothers a lot probably like most people um but yeah definitely grew up in a really good environment so i think coming up to rochester and kind of leaving that was very needed i think but at the same time also really nerve-wracking too how so uh, you said needed i think it was a it was a chance for me to finally be an individual you know instead mm -hmm. of being somebody that was just constantly under my parents you know somebody that was constantly being watched out for being looked after um it gave me a chance to become my own person you know, mm -hmm. and come up with my own identity um and mature, right? <laughs> so, there. yeah. So, uh, that must obviously have factored into journey to RIT. What, what, el what else drew you specifically to come here, other than, say, I don't know, duty school or something? Yeah, so actually, uh, my family's intent was for me to actually go to a SUNY school. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, my parents even bought a car before I graduated because they assumed that I was going to go to a SUNY school and just commute to school. 
But, um, you know, sometimes things don't go as planned. And uh, I think my first pick was actually SUNY Stony Brook, which is about 20 minutes from where I live. Very good computer engineering program, very good computer science program. Um, one of the best schools for engineering, honestly, out of all the SUNY schools. Um, and it was my top pick, and I didn't get in. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Um, but I got into a couple other schools, uh, namely St. John's University down in Queens, and also SUNY New Paltz, which is Paltz. Um, I visited both schools, didn't really like them that much. SUNY New Paltz was kind of in the middle of nowhere. Granted, you know, RIT is kind of in the middle of nowhere too. But like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's Rochester. It's somewhere. It's somewhere, but yeah. So my options weren't very, I didn't have that many options. Mm -hmm. So it was very limited in a way. Um, but I came and visited RIT and I was like, wow, the outside of the school looks absolutely atrocious. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't get over how ugly the campus looked, but I had the opportunity to meet uh, the people in the program that I was going to be in. Mm. Um, originally, my first, first choice major was actually uh, computer engineering. And I did not get into that. Um, thank God for that, actually. I don't think I would have survived, honestly. Um, <laughs> But my second choice was web and mobile computing, and I got into RIT for that. So when I came to visit in, I think, April, April of 2017, when, when they had, like, the orientation for the initial orientation for, like, prospective students, um, I came, had an opportunity to talk to some of the academic advisors for web and mobile, um, had the opportunity to talk to a couple of the professors for web and mobile, um, had the opportunity to talk to some of the students, you know, that were there representing the major, um, and I thought it was interesting, you know, um, I think growing up, like, I, I enjoyed technology a lot, mm -hmm. I enjoyed messing around with hardware a lot, I still do even now, um, you know, just taking things apart, putting things back together, building your own computer, server, whatever. So more computer hardware? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Not I, like cars? No, <laughs> no. Um, although I like cars too. Um, but that was kind of what I grew up with. So I got to experience that a lot during my time in like middle school, high school. Mm -hmm. And I kind of wanted to transition to more software. Um, I took a CS class um, in my senior year of high school. I absolutely loved it. So I was like, yeah, you know, I, I, I kind of want to try and do this in college too, you know, which is why I ultimately decided to do web and mobile. And um, yeah. I think the thing that really drew me the most to uh, RIT though was co-op. But like, oh. it's just, it gives you such a strong advantage compared to other other people, you know, other candidates and all that. So um, that along with I thought the program was also pretty good too. Um, some of the the classes that I took were interesting, um, which is why I ultimately decided to come to RIT. You know, it helped that the money was there too. So. <laughs> But yeah, that's that's how I went through and eventually came to the decision to attend RIT. Nice. So obviously you were drawn by all of these things. You were you wanted to, you wanted to get out of, wanted to get out of the house? Yeah. Become your own person. What was that transition like of coming up here to RIT? Hmm. What, what was that transition into the college life like for you? I think into the college life, it was it definitely wasn't smooth, that's for sure. Um, I think like most people, leaving your family that you've grown up with your entire life, and all of a sudden not having your parents around for everything, um, it's kind of like a like a shock, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, you know, I'm the oldest of four kids. So I also have a very big sense of responsibility. And growing up, I also had to mature a lot faster than I'd right. say other people would have to, you mm -hmm. know? Um, so once I got used to not having my parents around, once I got used to, you know, having to go and get my own food for once <laughs> instead of my mom just putting it in, in front of me right, and telling me to eat it, um, mm -hmm. I definitely got adjusted pretty fast. And I think that's when I was able to finally start becoming my own person. 
you know, becoming more mature, learning what it was like to actually live by myself for once. Um, so, but academically speaking, I think my first semester here at RIT was definitely the hardest. Um, had a couple weed out courses, uh, but overall, it wasn't bad, you know, and I, I got to join ACF, Agape Christian Fellowship, which is the club that I was a part of for my entire time here at RIT. So I'm a part of even now after graduating. So yeah, I think the people in that club also helped make that transition a lot easier. Good. What was the hardest class? Hardest freshman year. Hardest class. Computational problem solving one. Um, the reason why it was the hardest was that that year we had a adjunct professor for mm -hmm. that class. And you know how it is with adjunct professors. They're either terrible or they're good, you know. Um, it's very rarely the middle middle ground. Super nice guy, but um, he took a lot of his questions slash homework assignments from Stack Overflow, <laughs> so directly from it. So, you know, there were definitely students that decided to cheat quite a bit. Um, and that was not something that I was very fond of. So, yeah. It's unfortunate for everybody. <laughs> yeah, very unfortunate for everybody. Um, but I tried my best to actually learn. Um, and, but the problem was that, you know, I didn't really have peers in my class that were also trying to learn, right? Mm -hmm. So I couldn't really ask my classmates for question, but, you know, ask them questions on how they came to their conclusion. They came to their conclusion by copy pasting it from Stack Overflow. So, right. um, it was definitely the most challenging class. I was very fortunate to have a TA during that class that knew what was going on, you know, knew that, that um, some of the students were, were doing that. Um, and she was, she was awesome. She was, she was great. But unfortunately, it wasn't really enough for me to really, like, fully grasp that class in its entirety. Um, so, yeah, that was definitely my, my hardest class that I took that semester. So... Where, so did you live on or off campus? Yeah, so freshman year, I lived in the dorms like most freshman students do. Um, I was in Cake Leeson. Best dorm, by the way, just saying. It is the best. It's the best dorm. We have air conditioning. Um, and my sophomore and junior year, I moved off campus into the province. And then uh, my final two years at RIT, one of them I spent on co-op in its entirety. Um, I lived in an uh, off-campus house, house mm -hmm. off-campus. So that was kind of my living arrangement during my time at RIT as a student. Any particular fond boy memory while you lived on campus? Yeah, of course. I mean, Kate Gleason, it's like the parting dorm. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There were numerous nights where I'd come back from an ACF large group or whatever, you know, just hanging out with friends to people pass out on my floor <laughs> mm -hmm. in my dorm. I was in a quad. I was in a quad. And it was one of the quads that they converted the lounge into a quad. So, like, we had, like, the windows yeah, that yeah. faced the hallway, mm -hmm. and there was, there was just wood boards on that. So that, that, it was big, it was big. Like, it, they were huge. yeah, it's huge. Like e e each of my roommates, we had like our own little corner of the room. So massive, but yeah, like, you know, I, w I didn't really get a, it's not, I didn't fight with my roommates, but at the same time we weren't really friends. Right. You know, like we, we, we tolerated each other. And like, if there was something big that came up, we were able to talk to each other and talk it out, you know, but other than that, you know, I don't really talk to him now. Mm -hmm. Didn't really talk to him after freshman year. So, but actually, no. One of them I actually ended up moving into province with for one year. Yeah, but yeah, that's basically how my freshman dorm experience was like. Um, 
I was very rarely home. <laughs> so I was either uh, studying, studying in air quotes, um, here in Gaosano or one of the other places, you know, or I was hanging out with these deaf people. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. So when you live, when you ended up moving off of campus, hmm? what was the comfortable in the last very ending year? Not really. Um, the house I moved to is right off of West Hamiana Road, so it's like right in, in the middle. Oh, see the oh, really? Yeah, I was very close. It was it's right basically right in the middle of RIT and U of R. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, commute, maybe like seven minutes, not really that big of a deal. Um, I lived there for two years, but academically, I only went to school for one year. So the second year that, that I lived there, I was entirely on co-op. So I didn't have to commute from that place, that house, to here on campus. I was there. Yeah, I was just there. I, I was on co-op, fully remote. So you're here, you're going to campus, you go for many years now. During any of that time, are there any, or were there any favorite classes that you took or professors that you ran into? Or was it all just bleh? I wouldn't say it was bleh, you know? <laughs> like, I don't really make much use of my major anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I think I kind of came to that realization of that, you know, web mobile wasn't really something that I wanted to pursue in the long term, you know, like career wise. Mm -hmm. Right. But by the time that I came to that realization, it was a little too late for me to a different major. But I mean, I had all, most of my professors were pretty nice. You know, I don't think I had one professor where I was like, that guy or lady sucks. You know, wow, that's um, good. Yeah. Like I tolerated it. I tolerated most of my classes. Actually, there was one class called Designing the User Experience, where that class was actually kind of interesting. I was like, hmm. What major was that a class? For Web and Mobile. Web and mobile. Yeah, that was for one of the required classes for Web and Mobile. Um, and I think the reason why I enjoyed that so much was it gave, it gave me a chance to actually like talk to people mm. and like do interviews and stuff like that, which I actually like doing. You know, I'm not... I, my personality is not the type where I just sit around and code for eight hours a day, which is why, why I came to that realization. So, but yeah, I'd say if I had to pick a class where I was like, yeah, you know what, that class is actually pretty cool. The rest of it was pretty cool. Probably that class. Yeah, I like the, I like the, the work for it. It was very much more people focused rather than actual programming focused. Mm -hmm. So I got to learn a decent amount of like interpersonal skills that class as well and design skills as well so yeah if i had to pick a class that's probably the one where i was like yeah that was, i was pretty fond of that you know um one other class not related to my major was actually on the history of nazi germany which was very interesting actually because i got to learn more you know going through history in high school it's like you just know that like hitler not the greatest guy you know, that was like, that was my understanding at the, at, right. at the time, right? But once you actually go into like the nitty gritty, like what exactly it is that he did, like, I think that was what I found most interesting. Like, yeah, he wasn't a great guy, but at the same time, he also brought Germany from being just some, some country to like being one of the powerhouses of the world, right? Mm -hmm. And like seeing and learning about the process of how he did that. Although he didn't do it in, you know, the greatest of ways, right? Definitely could have done it, done it better, you know? But um, I think just learning about that process was very interesting. So, and the material was, was actually really interesting as well. So, yeah. So you mentioned that too late you realized that there was that the major you were in, Web and Mobile, wasn't exactly the way you wanted to go. Was there another major that, like, stood out to you or another career path that was the one for you? 
Yeah, I think now it's like I realized that I really want to go into IT. So technically, if I had switched from web and mobile into CIT, which was still part of, and it's called iSchool now, but it was still part of, you know, um, the information school, right? Then I think that's something that I would have been able to pursue a lot more and actually enjoy a lot more. But unfortunately, I came to that realization a little too late. So, yeah, I only really came to that realization after I had finished my co-ops. And at that point, I, I already had, um, you know, only one, two semesters left, right, of school. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. But if I could go back and be like, you know what? I probably should have done that instead, and that's probably what I'd do. Yeah. So. Um. Student organizations, clubs, student on campus activities. What did you what did you do in your spare time when you weren't doing web? Yeah, I was the only club that I really joined and was consistently a part of was Agape Christian Club. I tried other club other clubs like ACS for a little bit. That one I mainly just went because the Asian Cultural Society. That I just mainly went because I had some friends from high school that were part of the e-board there. Uh -huh. And they would occasionally have, you know, hangouts and all that. Um, and invite me to come and hang out, meet people and all that. So I would go on occasion, but very, very inconsistently. Um, only basically just to make friends, you know, yeah. and just hang out with people. But the organization slash club that I was most active in is definitely ACF. Agave Christian Fellowship, which I'm still involved in even now after graduating. Yeah. So how would you, I say this, uh, what, am I correct in that this had a major college life like in the middle? Oh yeah, of course. I think um, through ACF I was able to meet people that I can genuinely say are friends for my entire life. You know, people that I respect a lot, people that helped me, helped guide me, you know, throughout all my years of college right um whether it was you know academic academically i didn't really have that many people that, that were able to help me mm -hmm. but mentally you know spiritually most definitely right they were able to really help me out. um and i'm still friends with all of them even now even after we graduated um i'm still very heavily involved with with acf even now after graduating um and I think it's safe to say that without the people that I met through ACF, I probably wouldn't be the person that I am. Because I think that was another big part of me, as I mentioned earlier, maturing, right, once I got to college. Mm -hmm. um, and they, that, all the people that I met throughout those years in ACF definitely helped form, helped me become who I am now. So... So what 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 are the what are, what are the things you did in this club like now? Yeah, so the basically the ACF's consistent schedule is um, you would have a small group that you're a part of. So for me, during my freshman and sophomore year, we would meet on Wednesday nights, um, and then every Friday night we would have a large group. And being an inter inter campus club. We would rotate between meeting at RIT or meeting at U of R. Um, and then on Sunday, I would obviously go to the church, right? The, the well church that ACF is, is uh, involved with, right? Mm -hmm. um, so on a weekly basis, that was what I did. Um, but obviously, there were other, like, hangouts, you know, whether it was like, hey, somebody saying, like, like hey, you know, I'm going to go to Gracie's. Or I don't know why, why they would say that, but... You know, it was like, I'm going to be at Gracie's or I'm going to be at Global, you know, at like 6 o'clock. Be like, if anybody's free, you know, come pull up, you know, let's hang out, all that. Um, definitely spent a lot of time with the people in that club. That that also became my, my core friend group during my time here yeah. at RIT. What would be your favorite memory through that club? If you, if you... 
think it's really hard to pick just one. I think most of the time that I spent with ACF was really good. But if I had to pick one in particular, maybe it would probably be like a retreat, maybe the, the retreat of my sophomore year. So every year, um, the beginning of spring semester, ACF does a winter retreat. You know, before everybody has had all their assignments piling up and all of that, we try to do it within the first two to three weeks. Um, and I think during my sophomore year, there was one retreat that I was like, oh, this is really awesome. You know, it had a really big impact on me. Um, the material that we covered, the guest speaker that we had, um, it was all really, really good. And I think I got to really get close to a lot of the, a lot of my peers and a lot of the ACF students during that retreat, especially the new ones, right? The freshmen that came, that had come in. Um, I'd say that was probably one of my fondest memories during, during ACF. So, clubs, classes. Another big thing that RIT does is co-ops. Yes. So, what, what was your co-op experience like? Yeah, so Web and Mobile is a four-year program, and obviously I came in in 2017 and didn't graduate until 2020. So there's obviously a one-year gap where I ended up graduating later than expected, um, and that is because of co-op. <laughs> so um, I finished, academically, I had finished my junior year, but because I had no co-ops completed at that point, I was not able to enroll into my senior year classes, um, namely senior project that required you to be on co-op first. Um, so actually in 2019, I had a offer come in for one company, m and Bank, who also still actively recruits from RIT. Um, and they ended up rescinding my offer that year, actually, even after I had already accepted it. Mm -hmm. um, for that summer. So that that's what ended up setting me back quite a bit because then I had to find another co-op, right? right. Um, and by the time that I had received notification that my offer had been rescinded, it was already late April. So I only really had a month and a half-ish to find another co-op for the summer, which didn't happen up. So that's what ended up kind of setting me back a year. But eventually, um, you know, I was able to get my first co-op with Cincinnati Insurance Companies as a intern developer. That's that was the official title. Um, uh, and yeah, it was terrible. <laughs> hey, what'd you do? Yeah, I I did not enjoy the work very much. Um, I did a lot of programming. It was all programming, obviously. Uh, the main languages I used was C sharp. And then I also used VB and .NET. Mm -hmm. um, and they wanted, they had me work on some legacy software that they were, that they had acquired. Um, and they basically just threw me onto the team that was trying to make changes to that software mm -hmm. to make it more modern and all of that. Um, so that's like the work that I did for the most part. The only problem was that from a tech stack standpoint, I had no knowledge of C Sharp, VB, .NET, none of that. So I basically had to learn all of that on the spot while I was on co-op, which did not go very well. <laughs> so, yeah, and I'm not really a back-end guy. Like, e e even now, like, I mean, obviously I don't do development anymore, but even when I was, like, really into it, like, I did, back-end was, like, the thing I hated doing. And that was what the co-op was. So, yeah, so for the first half of it, that was what I did. And eventually, I think um, my supervisor and my, my advisor kind of came to the realization that I wasn't really doing that. <laughs> you know, um, I wasn't succeeding that, that much, you know. So they wanted to put me in a position where I can really get stuff done, and, but still learn, right? So instead of having me develop new code, they had me refactor old code instead. Mm -hmm. and, and 
take out any bits of unnecessary code, whether it was repeated or, or whatever, right? Um, so that's what I ended up doing for the last three or four months of my co-op. It was a double block. So I, I worked fall and spring semester for that co-op. And that's why I did. That I actually enjoyed doing quite a bit. Because like I was able to actually like really spend time reading the code and like seeing like, oh, this bit we don't need, this is already repeated, you know. And just going through and refactoring it all was actually pretty fun. Um, but yeah, that was my first co-op. Um, I had a second co-op that summer, MNT Bank. <laughs> they they got back to me and they said, yeah, so we're actually doing the internship this time. Um, actually, they, they reached out to me first. Um, That's just very nice. Oh, yeah. Sure. <laughs> um, they, they reached out to me first. and Because I, obviously I was still in contact with, you know, the... Uh, the intern advisor, right, at M&T Bank, super sweet lady, um, and uh, she was like, hey, you know, she reached out to me and was like, hey, we're going to do the internship this summer, like, actually this time, right, and we wanted to first reach out to the interns that we weren't able to take on last summer um, and see if they'd be willing to, you know, join us for the summer, um, so for me, I was like, hey, at this point, I already had all of my co-op locks done. Because I, I only needed to finish two blocks. And I had already done fall and spring semester. But I had nothing else to do during the summer. So I was like, yeah, you know, why, why not? You know, it, it'd be a good opportunity. So I ended up taking it. A lot of the work that I did was all, it was all in Angular. So it was all front-end. Fortunately, it was mainly front-end development, which is what I enjoyed doing. Um, and, but the experience w was not that great. Um, when I, when I, both these co-ops I went on were fully remote, so I never ended up going into the office for any of the work. So, um, when I got my laptop, the laptop that they gave me had so many problems with it. Like, the first one that they had sent me had the wrong account on it. So I had to send it back, wait like a week and a half for the laptop with my account on it to come back from the IT team um, and all that. Uh, and then eventually, like, I wasn't able to get, at, like, proper access to the Git repo. So I, I couldn't make any, I couldn't, I couldn't pull any code or make any, do any commits or anything. So I couldn't do any actual development myself. But fortunately, you know, one of my close friends now, right, he was also... Well, he's he's also he was also in mobile with me, and we still talk all the time even now. Um, but he was fortunately the only other intern on my team, and him and I are already really close. We're really close, so I was basically able to we we kind of the way that we did work was we tag teamed it. I would take a ticket, he would take a ticket, and like I would do what I could on my laptop with limited access to the code and then send it to him and he would he would do a, a commit and then put down that, hey, David did this, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so that's basically how it went for the first two months of that co-op. And like after two months, I finally had access to what I needed, right? So I, I was able to finally start doing my own, um, you know, and uploading and pushing my own commits and all that, so. Yeah, that was, it was fun, but I think those, that variable of just the inconsistency of the, the equipment and the software that we were using, so unbearable, I think. Um, and I think that's when I kind of realized that, like, yeah, I don't think development's for me. It's not because I had a bad experience with both those companies, but even when I was doing the work, I kind of felt like it was a little too much. It was too isolating in a way, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, like I mentioned earlier, like hey, you know, I kind of realized a little too late that I didn't really want to study one more one. But yeah, that's the reason why, like those co-op experiences. That's that's what I learned from co-op. <laughs> yeah. So based on your experiences, they were both remote. Yes. Do you prefer a non-remote working environment? Yes, I do. You do? Yeah. I think it's mainly 
just because I'm very extroverted <laughs> and I like being around people. So, and like, yeah, I didn't really have the, when I was on those co ops, I didn't really have the opportunity to make. I think it made it really hard to make more personal connections. But that was full year mode. Um, no, it was very, yeah, I didn't really enjoy it very much. <laughs> Falconer. Journey, you know, done all your co ops? Yep. So. What next? What happens? What happens after that? Andy? After M N T Bank, well, I had my final year mm -hmm. at RIT. Um, probably the biggest class that I took, senior capstone project, uh, senior project. Um, with the way that high school does things, well, they did things at the time. I don't know if that, that's how they do it now. Um, basically, they would have. There were three majors in high school that were represented. I majored web mobile, CIT, and HCC. Those are the three majors that were a part of the high school. And basically, they put us into a group where you would have some CIT students, some web mobile students, and some HCC. And you would basically work as a team because each of those major selected majors had areas that they were strong in, right? With us web and mobile students, we're very good at development, right? So we were good at, very good at software development with CIT. They were a lot better with database management, stuff like that, right? And with HCC, they were better with designing, interviewing, and and talking to people, you know? That was the intention. So, yeah, I took that class. Um, I was, we ended up having way too many web mobile students, actually, on my team, um, and no HCC students. So, I ended up, at this point, I already knew that I didn't really want to do development anyways. So I ended up taking the project manager role for my team. So I ended up not doing any development actually for my senior project. So I was the one that helped finalize the design of our website, which was the, our, the goal of our project was to create a centralized website where people could go to sign up for vaccines. Obviously it was in response to COVID at the time, but Rather than making it specifically for COVID, we generalize it to more just vaccines. Because um, obviously each provider, whether it's like CVS or Walgreens, they have their own website, right? We wanted to make one central, the goal was to make one central site where you would be able to sign up for any, any vaccine with any provider. Um, so that was the goal of the project. And I took the project management role. I was one in charge of on the stakeholders, finalizing design, making sure everything was going smoothly, managing tickets, um, and stuff like that. So I think it definitely helped that we had complications in our team. I think one of one of our uh, one of our team members actually that was in charge of doing a lot of the front end development um, ended up getting sick and was basically out for half the semester. Um, so our our team ended up being Short a developer. So fortunately, I was able to talk to the professor, you know, ask him if we could basically recruit a developer from one of the other teams um, to have him help us. And uh, I was able to do that. And obviously, I helped also with the development. Um, so I was kind of wearing two different hats at the same time. I was a project manager and also partially a developer as well, since. I was a web and mobile student, so I, I do understand how the development process works, how they actually develop the code and do the front end development. So that was the responsibility that I took on for that that, that class. Um, I had other classes too, but none of them were anywhere near as significant as your project was. So was the project successful? We did the best that we could. <laughs> uh, give, given our circumstances, um, uh, our professor also threw in a wrench because senior project is a is a two semester class. So we had a, we we end up changing teammates during the spring semester. So we lost one of our developers and then gained a designer. But like at that point, it didn't really matter because we already had the design of our website. 
website completed. So like, yeah, it was terrible. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that was, that was that experience. Very, yeah, not great, but still, it was definitely a fun project, and I got to learn a lot from that from that class too, especially speci more specifically around project management. Um, so, yeah, very interesting. So you know, we we now reached the end. We reached the gra reach your graduation. All your time here at RIT, was there a particular year or period of time that was most difficult for you? Was that still freshman year, or was there time in between that was maybe most difficult? Particular reasons? Yes, I think most RIT students can relate to this. For me personally, it was most of junior year, um, mainly because I had to take some very challenging courses. But on top of that, I was still very pressured to find a co-op. Um, and I think most RIT students understand that, that have reached that point, right, um, will understand how stressful that can actually be. Um, and I think that added variable of co-op um, made that year very challenging. Um, academically speaking, mentally speaking, physically speaking, but definitely the most. Um, it didn't help that I had already gone through everything to get an offer, and then getting that offer rescinded, that didn't help either, me mentally, right? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, if I had to pick one particular year, that I'd say that was probably the most challenging. Looking back over all of it, is there anything you wish that you had done differently as you went through? As yeah. A student? Switch my major. <laughs> From the, from the get go, from the get go, but I mean you can't go back and repeat the history, in, right? So yeah. um, I definitely would have switched my major to CIT um, mm -hmm. just because it's something that I'm much more interested in. This is me looking at it now, right? Going, right. You know, when I was a student, like it's not something I even can. Um, but yeah, the biggest one would definitely be switching my major. I think everything else I'd still want to be exactly the same. Like being in, heavily involved in ACF, I'd want all that. So, um, but yeah, definitely switching my major would be the biggest one where I'm like, yeah, I wish I could go go back and change that, <laughs> you know? Um, but yeah. So, What happens, you know, you graduate mm -hmm. and now you're an alumni. So what, what happened? Where, where did you go? What did you do? Yeah, so fortunately, I was able to find a job right after, well, before I even graduated. Mm -hmm. um, I worked at AWS for about a year and five months as one of their cloud support engineers. Um, and... and yeah, that's basically what I did right after graduation. Um, and yeah, it was definitely an experience. I think it was definitely more along the lines of what I kind of wanted to do because it was more customer facing rather than strictly development, right? Mm -hmm. um, obviously still very technically involved, right? I still had to make use of a very technical skill set. Um, but Ultimately, uh, I decided to leave that role, and right now it's March of 2024. Um, I left that role back in November of 2023, like midway into November. So since then, I've mainly just been hanging out here in Rochester, <laughs> still being very heavily involved with ACF, you know, the, the organization, um, helping out with whatever it is that I can help out with. Um, but starting from April, I will be working for a different company, uh, doing, I'll be working as a field service technician and for CVS. And that will be what is, what is next for me technically. So, yeah. How would you say that 
post-graduation, how much of your degree? Much or? Not much, not much. I think during my time in AWS, uh, the classes that I took related to databases were very helpful, uh, mainly because I was a part of the big data team and a lot of the work that we did was in SQL. Um, so that part of my, of my degree, I definitely made a lot of use of, but other than that, I think just having an understanding how programs and websites work in general definitely helped a bit, but very few of those actual programming skills, like you know, being able to actually properly develop, very few of those were actually transferable into my career, the, the job that I, that I picked up right after graduation. So, so, being an alumni, what, what would be your advice first to current high school students? Mm -hmm. well, there might be one in Brooklyn, Queens, or somewhere else in New York State, mm -hmm. or somewhere else that might be looking <clears throat> for college. Do you have, what is your advice for them? Who recommend they go to? My advice for most of those high school students would be rather than trying to go to the best college that you can, try and find what it exactly is that you are passionate about and what you actually want to do. I think, especially now, being somebody that's in that's been in the the industry right for almost two years now, right? Um, the importance of a college degree, I've realized is not as big as what exactly is it that you know and who do you know, at least career-wise, right? Obviously, RIT is a fantastic school. I'm not saying that RIT is a terrible school. Their programs are great, especially if you want to pursue a, a STEM degree, right? Um, but at the same time, I think it's equally important that these high school students, they first find out what it exactly it is that they want to do, right? And then based off of that, go into what makes the most sense for you and your, and your personal circumstance, right? Whether it's financially speaking, you know, mm -hmm. I was very fortunate to have RIT give me a, a decent financial aid package, which made it make sense for me and my personal circumstance. Um, but, you know, if prospective students don't have that same luxury that I did, um, I think it makes sense for them to really do what is best for their personal circumstance, while also still pursuing something that they think that they actually be. So, whether it's going to trade school instead, right, or hey, you know, I, I do need a four-year degree, right? Or, or even going into a community college, right? Getting an associate's degree and eventually realizing, hey, you know what? I want to pursue a bachelor's and then going into a four-year college, right? Um, with that associate's degree. You know, I think financially speaking, it makes a lot of sense. College has gotten a lot more expensive. Even, even for me, like, seeing the price of even, just since I'm still here with at RIT, right? Like, just seeing... The price of what tuition costs now compared to what I was paying back in 2017 when I came in as a freshman is like night and day. So that's why I, I to all the prospective students, you know, the high schoolers, like do what makes the most sense for your personal circumstance. You know, um, don't completely disregard um, finances, right? If you <laughs> so. Yeah, that that that's that's the advice that I would definitely give to those those people. What advice would you give to current students at RIT who are some level <laughs> of guide? Yeah, um, please stop using ChatGPT so often. <laughs> I understand the convenience. I understand that this is me speaking from the perspective of somebody that worked at AWS okay. and somebody that worked big data, which is what powers AI. 
So <laughs> I understand that it looks like a very useful tool, and I'm not denying that it's not. It's extremely useful and extremely helpful. But ultimately, if whatever organization that you end up at or whatever company you end up at has policy that doesn't allow you to use AI, then you're, gonna, you're kind of screwing yourself over, <laughs> right? Which is why it's important for you to, rather than have AI do all of your homework for you, use it as a tool to help you complete your homework, you know, while still learning everything along the way, right? So, yeah, that's like the biggest advice that I would give to current RIT students. Um, this is, uh, I'm speaking from a computer. Right, because that's right, what right. that's what I majored in, and that's what I'm seeing even now, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's that's the advice that I would give to current RIT students. I understand the convenience; I totally get it. Trust me, I do. And even when you're working in the field, like you're going to Google have more than ninety percent of what it is that you need to do, anyways. Yeah. But in the end of the day, you're still learning something, right? So, but just having AI do all your work for you is not going to make it's not gonna make you learn stuff, so, or and it's not gonna challenge you to actually think, right, and mm -hmm. and problem solve, right. So that's the advice I would give to current a current RIT students. But hey, you know, generative AI it's constantly evolving. It's you know like ginormous, and I get it. And hey, there there could be a student listening to this five years from now, and they're like, dude, like. What's this guy talking about? Like, literally, AI can just do everything now, you know? Then, okay, cool. I, I get it. You know, then, then keep on doing, instead of, you know, actually studying, you know, study how to come up with proper prompts so you can get the answer that you're desiring for from, from AI. Um, but, yeah, that's the advice I would give to current RIT students as of March 18th, 2024. <laughs> so... <laughs> What advice would you give for students? I know a lot of advice questions. What advice would you give for current students in them trying to go ops or their first job upon graduating? Yeah, I think finding your first co-op and finding your first job after graduation are two completely For me personally, finding my first co-op was more, much more challenging. Um, the best advice that I would give is don't bother with job boards. Um, the, the, I use LinkedIn, and that's where I had the most success. I tried the be my best to connect with recruiters, um, reach out to people that were at companies you know, that I was interested in. I didn't do it for every, every single job that I applied to, but mainly just the ones where I was like, hey, you know, I'm actually really good. Um, that's the advice that I would give to those that are seeking co-op. Um, and also, talk to people. You know, in the end of the day, it's important, it's more important about what, about who you know, rather than what you know, sometimes. So, make connections when you can. You know, there's plenty of RIT professors that already have connections, right? So, if you're able to get close with your professors, they might be able to, they most likely, honestly, would be able to set you up with co-op, right? Um, or at least put in a good word for you, right? So, and build up a network, you know? Build up a LinkedIn network, reach out to RIT alumni, right? Um, but don't do it in a weird way, because <laughs> I've had people reach out to me through LinkedIn as an RIT alumni, mainly when I was working at AWS, because Amazon's kind of a big company, <laughs> and they'd be like, Hey, so so you know whatever, and I was like, yeah, no thanks, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but make it personal, you know. Make use of your alumni network, right? Because um, us as alumni, we get it. We get how hard it is, how challenging it is, because we went through it also, you know. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that that's the that's the tip that I would give to co-ops for full time. Um, I guess most of that would still apply for full time too, but yeah, <laughs> I I think the biggest advice that I would actually give is 
if you're finding a hard finding it hard to find a full time job straight out of college, which I don't blame you, especially if you're in the tech field, it's really really hard right now. As of March 18, twenty four, um, because we have just had several major tech companies throughout the past two years lay off tons and tons and tons of workers, um, and it's very hard. <laughs> so I get it, um, but rather than trying to find what it exactly find a position that you are really interested in i think i don't think it's a bad idea to more find a company that you really want to work for and then try and find a position within that company where you wouldn't mind doing the work right but still ideally it's still related to if you're in the tech field it's still related to tech or if you want to do computing it's still somewhat related to computing right because ultimately it is much easier for you to internally transfer, then try to come in from the outside, right? Like there's definitely gonna be an opportunity. This is also me speaking from the perspective of somebody that worked at Amazon, one of the largest companies in the world, right? It is much easier for you to transfer internally rather than trying to come in from outside. So, all, you know, if you're finding it really hard to find an actual full-time job, you know, just get your foot into the door, into whatever company it is, right, that you want to work for, whether it's, like, Meta or Google or Amazon or whatever, you know, get your foot in there, do the work, right, and show how invaluable you are, and then eventually move on to what it really is that you want to do, right, because um, it will be much easier, and you'll get there at some point, as long as you put the work in. So, yeah, that's the advice that I would give. So, is there anything else that we've discussed or anything else you that we've talked about that you wanted you would like to elaborate? Anything else I want to elaborate on? I don't really think so. I, I think I've elaborated on, on most of the points that we talked about. So, I think especially for current students that aren't too far into your degree, um, if you don't like your degree, please get out of it. <laughs> Transfer earlier. Um, then you'll end, you might end up being in a, in a stage of regret like I am, right? Mm -hmm. um, granted, I'm very fortunate that things end up working out for me personally, because web and mobile is still a very computing and tech-focused degree, and I love technology, and I, I'm very passionate about technology. So that degree in itself has made me, has allowed me to find positions that aren't exactly development, but, you know, depending on what your major is, and if you want to go into a different industry, it may be a lot more complicated, right? So, yeah. Just look back, reflect, and see if what it exactly it is that you're studying is what you actually want. Or it's too late, right? Mm -hmm. um, RIT has so many programs, so like, you'll, you'll be able to find something. You know? But even if it's not at RIT, there's plenty of other universities out there too. Final question before we wrap up our interview. Sure. What is, if any, best restaurant on the RIT campus? <laughs> okay. So during my time as a freshman, I thought hands down Brits was the best place to eat on campus. But things have changed since then, and Brits no longer has paninis. And that was something that I ate all the time as a freshman. So, I mean, I haven't had campus food since basically freshman year on a consistent basis, but I'm biased to Salsaritas, mainly because I worked there when I was a student. Um, but, yeah, if I had to pick a place now, it would definitely be Salsaritas still. Gracie's? Team Gracie's? Gra Gracie's has gone through a lot, though, since, or no team. since my, my freshman year. It's like, you guys got a, a brick oven, like a pe an actual pizza oven. So, like, so, like, <laughs> I think that's, like, not bad. You know? But I also heard that Gracie's is no longer, no, no longer all you can eat. Or is it all you can eat again? Um, they changed it. For COVID, up until this year, it was you go and you pay for one meal. Ah. 
they move the RIT is moving back to the some of the old plants. I see that they used to. Yeah, for Unlimited. Let's see. If that's the case, then I don't know, maybe maybe Gracie's is where it's at, but I don't know. During my freshman year, <laughs> Gracie's for me personally, it was all you could eat cereal and all you could eat bananas. So and all you could eat ice cream. I very rarely had actual food there. So but yeah, that's what I would pick. That's what my pick would be. Well, alrighty. Thank you very much for sitting down with me and thank you. You're welcome.